United program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Diego police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 154. Go to the Prescott Hotel and investigate the report of a murder. The body of a woman is found in a room. That's all. gasoline, the city and county purchasing departments make scientific tests before they specify a gasoline for use in their great fleets of emergency equipment. Four main questions must be answered. Which gasoline starts quickest? Which accelerates fastest? Which delivers most power? Which is most economical to you? On this basis, Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline has repeatedly won against all competition in Los Angeles, Oakland, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego... Maricopa, the largest county in Arizona, and in many, many other cities and counties throughout this territory. This success is due primarily to the Sinclair cracking process. From one of the world's most modern refineries comes this balanced gasoline. Rio Grande cracked with tetraethyl. First, quick stopping. Second, fast acceleration. Third, surging power. Fourth, mileage. These are the factors that cause Rio Grande cracked gasoline to be used exclusively in so many, many police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. These are the factors that give police car performance. Try Rio Grande cracked gasoline in your car. Do this tomorrow. And now it is our pleasure to present W.A. Huggins, Secretary to Chief of Police Sears, San Diego, Mr. Huggins. Good evening. The San Diego Police Department has had many strange murders to solve, but the case of the girl in room nine was one of the most incredible cases to be found in our files. Detectives investigating the circumstances surrounding it found themselves literally face to face with a blank wall. There seemed to be no clues to go on, no reason for anyone to have committed the crime. And yet, there was a brutally beaten body of a woman lying in the morgue to spur them on in the hunt for the killer. A hunt which led them from one end of San Diego to the other and back again before they finally got a lead to the murderer's identity and managed to arrest him. But, as you will see, despite the many difficulties they encountered, despite the lack of clues, in the end, the killer was brought to justice, which once again goes to show... And when a person resorts to murder, no matter how careful they may be, the chances that they will get away with it are less than one in 100. San Diego, May 15, 1918. The year that is to write Venus to one of history's bloodiest chapters, the war to make America safe for democracy. From every state west of the Mississippi River, a solid line of men pour into the training camps. The good and the bad, the rich and the poor, all reduced to one common denominator in the final desperate drive to meet war's demand. More men, more arms. It is a few minutes after midnight when two sailors from the USS Vicksburg on shore leave amble erratically up the street come to a swaying stop in front of a little transient hotel where they have rooms for the night. Steady, George, me boy. You're rolling in your own weight. I'm doing nothing of the sort. You're the one that's doing the rolling. I am rolling. Listen, sailor, I practically carried you out of that joint we were in. You must have been planning on drinking the police drink. Yeah, I would have, too. If you hadn't got so drunk, I had to take you home. What do you think of that? Huh? What do you think of that? I think maybe we'd better go in the hotel before we get thrown in the brig. That's what I think. That's a good idea. Come on. Listen, sailor, I said this way. What are you trying to do, start an argument? Sure, any time. Hi, I'm a poor... Oh, come on, George. You can't even see where you're going. I'll take you right to our room. Now, come on, stop yet. Ah, see, you don't want to fight, huh? You got cold feet. How do you want? Oh, all I want to do is to get you out of this hall before the landlady throws us both out. Come on. These stairs. Easy. Uh, that's the spirit. 
One at a time. One at a time. Don't tell me how to walk upstairs. I was walking upstairs before you were born. And down them, too. Sure, I know all about it. Uh, easy. That's it. One at a time. One at a time. One at a time. You sound like a gramophone record I got stuck in a groove. One at a time. One at a time. Shh. You want to wake the whole hotel? Come on. Room eight. Oh, no. Room nine is the one we're in. Now, listen, George. What do you want to be so stubborn for? I know what room we're in, and it's eight. Nine, 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 nine. All right, but shut up. It's room nine. Sure. Room nine, but shut up. Here we are. Now, see if you can stand up till I get the door open. Sure, I can stand up. Why wouldn't I be able to stand up? Quiet. Come on. I'll turn on the light. I can't see in the dark. Only owls can see in the dark. All right, wait a minute. There's your lights. Hey, what's the matter? George, look on the floor. Oh, what's the matter with the floor? I don't see... Oh. A woman. What's she doing in our room? Listen, George, snap out of it. This woman's dead. Dead? Yeah. Look at her throat. Somebody's murdered. Murdered? Let me see. Look at those finger marks on her neck. Looks like she'd been strangled. Yeah. Hey, look out. What are we going to do? we got to let someone know. Maybe they'll think we did it. That's why you got to sober up fast. Well, don't worry. I'm sober right now. Then come on. we got to report this to the landlady. Shocked into instant sobriety by the horror of their discovery, the two sailors rush down the hall to the landlady's room and tell her about it. And in less than 20 minutes, Chief of Detective Joseph Myers arrives at the hotel where he is met by Officer O.U. Martin. Together, the two men look at the bruised and beaten body and then question the landlady. What is your name, ma'am? Anna Johnson. Anna Johnson, eh? Yeah. Well, tell me, Mrs. Johnson, just what happened this morning. Well, I was asleep in my room. Room 12, it is. And a little after 12, I was waked up by someone pounding on the door. When I opened, there was two sailor fellows there. They told me there was a dead woman in their room. And what did you do? Well, I got up and put a robe on. Then we went to the room, and I saw it was Clara, and she was badly hurt, so I called the police. Well, do you know of anyone who might have wanted to do this to Clara? Oh, no, I know of no one. She was so sweet, like a sister. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Johnson. Deeply sorry. <laughs> Thank you. How long has she been employed here? Several months. Married? I believe she was. But she was separated from her husband. Anything happened last night that might throw some light on this? Uh, nothing that I know of. I came home from a show, and Clara had company. A girlfriend and her sweetheart. Oh, they were good friends of Clara. No chance of their doing this, eh? Oh, no. They were her best friends. Well, what happened then, Mrs. Johnson? Well, they went home about 10 o'clock, and Clara and I had a little food to eat, and I went to bed. Clara came to my room because I had a headache and she brought me some aspirin. Then she left for her room and I went to sleep. The first thing I remember after that was the sailor boys waking me. And that's all you can remember? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Mrs. Johnson. Don't let anybody touch that body, Sergeant. I'm going down to talk to those sailors. In the small lobby of the hotel, Myers questions the two sailors satisfies himself that they have no connection with the murder. A close check on the rest of the hotel guests brings no clue, and Chief Myers turns his attention to the hotel register. Suddenly, his eyes come across one name that bears no address after it. It is written on the page dated May 14th, 1918, and shows the room number to be seven. With this slim lead, he returns to room 12 and once again questions Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson, there's something here that doesn't quite jibe with what my men have found. I thought you might be able to help. What's that? This name on the register. Jack Cree, as near as I can make it out. Who is he? Jack Cree? Hmm. Jack Cree? Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember now. He was a soldier. He stayed here last night? Yeah. He came in early in the evening before I went to the show. I rented the room. Room 7, is that right? Yeah. Uh, the boys looked that room over, Chief. The bed hadn't been slept in. Any sign of him? No, sir. Then I'll stake my bottom dollar. He's the lad we want. Look, Martin, get a description of him from Mrs. Johnson and any other information you can get. I'm going to call the office and get Stevens over here to run this down. A 
telephone call to the police station results in the arrival a short time later of Detective H.C. Stevens, who, after learning all he can from Chief Myers, takes charge of the investigation. His first move is to re-question Mrs. Johnson. There's very little doubt in my mind about this Cree fellow's having done the job. The only trouble is, who is he and where is he? You've got to help us in answering those questions, Mrs. Johnson. All right. I guess I will have to tell you then. But I had hoped this wouldn't be necessary. What do you mean by that? This soldier, the one you was asking about, he did something that I didn't want to tell. He followed me into my room last evening after I had showed him. He began to act terribly. He, he tried to make love to me. What did you do? I told him he couldn't behave that way in this hotel and forced him to leave. He called me a dreadful name as he went down the stairs. A terrible name. Hmm. That's the last time you saw him? Yes. Martin, Chief Myers tell me you have a description of the man. Is that right? Yes, sir. I just got it from Mrs. Johnson. There you are. Uh, approximately 33 years old. Dark complexion. Five feet seven inches tall. Not much to go on huh? with about 100,000 men in uniform in San Diego alone. Pretty slim. Uh, what about this girl that was killed? She ever had any trouble with any soldiers or sailors, Mrs. Johnson? Well, what, yeah. Once she did. A few weeks ago, four soldiers from Camp Carney was here. And they accused her of having stolen $40 from their room. But the military police who came to investigate told me later that the soldiers had lied to them all. I see. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Johnson. Yeah? I guess there's nothing more we can do here for the time being. Keep an eye on things, Martin, while I do a little canvassing of the neighborhood hotels. Pretty thin lead, but this Cree fellow might have stayed somewhere around here after he got through his dirty work. We're following up anyway. I'll be back later. So Detective Stevens begins a tour that takes him from one small hotel to another, up one street, down the next. And finally, as he is just about to give up, he enters the 12th place, the Aspen House on 5th Street... And for the twelfth time, asks the same question. Did you have anyone come in early this morning and ask for a room? Is this in connection with the murder over at the Prescott? Yes, it is. Well, there was a fellow who came in about 5.30. He was plenty drunk and he acted sort of nervous-like. Yes? I told him the room would be a dollar and he forked it over without saying a word. But he refused to register. Refused to register, eh? Yes, sir, and that's not all. I got a look at his hands and they were scratched. There was blood on them, so help me. Go on. I thought to myself when I seen them that they looked like fingernail scratches. But it wasn't none of my business, so I didn't say anything. Anyway, he left a call for eight this morning. And when I went up and woke him, he jumped up and stared at me for a minute. And then he slammed the door in my face. Is he here now? No, sir. He left about 20 minutes ago. It was an awful hurry. Uh, what did he look like? Well, he was about 35. Five feet ten, I'd say. Weighed about 170. Black hair, gray around the temples. And wore a dark suit with a box coat and a black fedora hat. I figured he was a gambler by his look. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey, where are you going? Want to get that description to every policeman in San Diego. Thus, the first real clue of any importance, and the start of a sweeping dragnet of San Diego. Police bulletins describing the mysterious Jack Cree are issued to every man in the San Diego Police Department, to all bus and train station officials, with orders to arrest and hold if located. And while every available officer in the city looks for the fugitive, Detective Stevens pays a visit to the four soldiers who had claimed the murdered woman had robbed them. And though he exhausts one clue when he finds their alibi perfect, he stumbles on to another that sends him to the naval training camp at Balboa Park, where he interrogates one of the sailors. I understand that you're a friend of Ed Bolas, is that right? Yeah, I know him. How well? Well, we went around together a good bit. Guess I know him as well as anyone. Well, tell me something. How did he and Clara Minor get along? Mm hmm. What do you mean? Do you ever have any trouble? Well, I. <laughs> have a cigarette. Oh, thanks, I will. It's all right. Keep the pack. Plenty more where they came from. Oh, well, thanks. Cigarettes are pretty scarce out here these days. <laughs> yeah, I figure they were. How about Ed and Clara? How'd they get along? Well, they they had a little trouble. You know how it goes, another woman and all that. Ed was engaged to Clara, but he, he sort of fell for this Mary Bedford. That was quite a mess. Well, what happened? Well, this Bedford woman got jealous of Clara and tried to commit suicide. And then when it didn't work, she told Eddie he'd better watch his step or she'd make a good job of it next time and kill both of them. I see. You know where this Bedford woman lives? Yeah, I... Yeah. I'm afraid I've talked too much right now. Oh, wait a minute. You don't want to shield a murderer, do you? Well, of course not. Well, what are you talking about? Talking too much already. I guess I didn't realize what I was saying. That's the ticket. Where does she live? 
Over at the Hotel Dinsmore. You know, it's in the same block as the Prescott. Yeah. An odd coincidence, isn't it? Bolus would like to get rid of Clara because she was an obstacle. Mary Bedford would like to do the same because she hated Clara. She lives in the same block Clara was murdered in. I'd say quite a coincidence. Questioning of both Mary Bedford and Ed Bolus leaves Detective Stevens with a great many doubts as to their alibis. But not wanting to make any direct accusations until he has proof, he has them both held in technical custody as witnesses and then proceeds to run down the many other loose threads of the case. And as each day goes by, it leaves him with some new development. He learns that the janitor of the hotel, a man with a past record, has been missing since the morning of the murder. And immediately word is flashed over the police communication system to be on the lookout for him. Several men are paraded before the landlord of the Aspen house and promptly released when he fails to recognize any of them. The murder of Clara Minor begins to assume the aspect of a huge cobweb, each clue stretching out like one of the web's infinitesimal strands. And at last, with hundreds of leads to run down, each one vitally important to his case, Detective Stevens talks to his superior, Detective Inspector Paul J. Hayes, and requests another man to assist him. I'd like to be able to do it, Henry. You know that without my saying it. But we're up against the wall for men. All the boys are out on jobs. Isn't there just one you could get away from some other job and let me have? Not a chance. As a matter of fact, I just assigned the last one I had to the club, a robbery deal. You know, the one two sailors robbed and beat him the other night? Yes. I've got plenty of trouble over that. Every citizen in San Diego is on our necks to get the ones who did it. Well, I guess that settles that, huh? I'm afraid so, Henry. I know what a tough nut you have to crack. But it's all yours. All right, Inspector. Thanks anyway. If you come out all right with your clobber deal. Thanks. If I don't, I'm liable to be looking for a new job. At least I will if the citizens of San Diego have anything to say about it. I'll beat it before you think of something else you want. Right. Goodbye, sir. So, Henry Stevens carries on his investigation alone. One by one, he eliminates his leads. Patiently, he wades through the mass of information he has gathered, checking this item, throwing away that item. And when he has checked every known point against the other, he finds himself with at least three possible suspects. Edgar Bolas, the ex-convict janitor, and the mysterious missing soldier, Jack Cree. Follows days upon endless days spent in training camps, in saloons. In hundreds of dives where soldiers and sailors meet to drown out the cares of the day with women and alcohol. Always the same question foremost in his mind. Pardon me, buddy, but you know of a Jack Cree in this outfit? Jack Cree? Oh, I never heard of him. Where's he from? Never mind. Doesn't matter where he's from. Oh, Steve. Steve, you happen to know of a soldier by the name of Jack Cree? Nah, I make it a habit not to know soldiers' names. Sailors neither, for that matter. As soon as they get to know you too well, they start asking for drinks on the cuff. It ain't good business. I'm looking for a man by the name of Cree, Lieutenant. Jack Cree. You happen to have one in your outfit for that name? Sorry, there's no one by the name of Cree in the 40th Division. Is there anything else? No, uh, thanks anyway. I hadn't figured there would be. So it goes, day after day, night after night, and still no sign of the missing man. Days drag on into weeks, weeks into months. The Clara Minor case fades from the front page of the papers. The outraged citizenry of San Diego gradually forgets that there ever was a girl named Clara Minor. Forgets that there ever was a clobber robbery case. But Detective Stevens remembers, never does he slacken his vigilance for a moment, and time passes. February 1st, 1919. Nine long months since the brutal murder in room nine. In the office of Captain Frank McGraw, the United States Intelligence Service, a captain of the guard stands. Two young soldiers from Camp Kearney in his custody. Sergeant Kelly, sir, reporting with Privates Willis and Waterman. All right, men, relax. Thank you, sir. So you're Willis and Waterman, eh? Tom Willis and Alan Waterman, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, men, we've caught up with you at last. And that's going to be pretty tough on both of you. What do you mean by that, sir? You know only too well what I mean, Waterman. That watch you men pawned has turned up in Oklahoma. And it was pawned there by a girl who was a sweetheart of one of the boys in the 21st. You're from the 21st, are you not? Yes, sir, but I don't know nothing about no watch. Well, how about you, Willis? 
Your memory any better than your buddy's? I... No, sir. I don't know what you mean, sir. I, I never pawned a watch anywhere. That's right. You didn't pawn it. But one of you gave it to a girl, and that girl made the break. Now, how about it? You don't know nothing about it, Captain, and I don't know neither. Brady might spill, eh, Waterman? Well, I think you're right about that. I think he will spill when Detective Sears and Kelly get talking to him. Those boys have a way with them that usually gets results. And a short time later, Detectives George Sears and Harry Keller join Captain McGraw in his office, where they're informed of the results of his questioning. Realizing that the younger man, Willis, is almost ready to talk, they have him brought in without Waterman. Sit down, Willis. I want to have a talk with you. Yes, sir. You're uh, pretty young, aren't you, Willis? Yes, sir. I guess so. About 16? 17, sir. Young looking for his age, isn't he, Captain? Yeah. Pretty nice looking, too, for a boy who'd go around robbing people. You know, I don't think Willis planned that deal, Captain McGraw. I have a pretty good hunch that his pal took the whole thing up and got him mixed up in it. Now, how about that, Willis? Isn't that what really happened? I... I, I don't know what deal you mean. Why, well, sure you do. You remember old man Clobber, the fellow you and Waterman beat up and robbed? That's where you got the watch. I didn't hit him. Oh, Waterman did, huh? Now then, why don't you tell us all about it? Might just as well, you know. Might go a little easier on you if you came to me. I'm afraid of what Waterman would do. Well, you needn't be. Detective Sears has enough on him right now to send him up for a nice long stretch, even if he never talks. So you can tell him anything you want to. Is that right, Lieutenant Sears? That's right, Wallace. Then I'll talk. I'll tell you the whole thing. Waterman and I did do the job. But I didn't want there to be any violence. He told me we'd just stick a gun in the guy's ribs and take his money away from him. Honest, I didn't have anything to do with the beating end of it. I even tried to stop Ellen when he started hitting him. the young soldier, 17-year-old Willis, cracks under the skillful questioning of Detective Sears and Captain McGraw, blurts out the whole story while a stenographer takes it down in shorthand. And when he is finished, Detective Sears realizes that his long job is done, the clobber robbery is solved. Then suddenly, as Willis is about to leave the room, he turns, looks back at the two men for an instant, and then... Captain McGraw. Yes, Willis? There's something else I'd, I'd like to tell you, too. Something I've got to tell you. All right. Start in. Waterman killed that woman over at the Prescott Hotel. He came back to camp the next morning and told me so. He showed me his hands. They were all clawed up. I had to tell you, Captain. I couldn't hold it any longer. It was burning a hole inside of me. I had to tell you. Convinced by the youth's sincerity that he's telling the truth, Detective Sears immediately phones Stevens, tells him to come out at once. And in less than 20 minutes, the police car screams to a grinding stop outside. Detective Henry Stevens rushes into the office. Well, what's up? Hello, Henry. I think we got the lad who killed Clara Mann. What? Yep. He and another lad are the two that pulled the target job. And just a few minutes ago, the younger one cracked and voluntarily told us that his partner, Waterman, had done the press cut job. Is Waterman here? Right in the next room, under guard. Well, hang on until I get back. Listen. Have a line of men with this Waterman among them, will you? I want a positive identification. <laughs> Rushing back to town, Stevens bundles the landlady, Anna Johnson, into the police car with him and heads back for the camp. Arriving there, they discover a full company standing at attention in the driveway. Asking Mrs. Johnson to follow him, he walks down the line of men. Halfway down the front rank... There. There is the man. How can you remember me after such a long because time? Because you call me that horrible name. That's why I could never forget you. Well, Waterman, I guess that settles your future for a while. Come on, I've got a lot of things to ask you. I'm warning you right now. The answers had better be right. But Alan Waterman refuses to talk. For hours, Stevens hurls questions at him. And the answer to each one is always the same. Waterman will not crack. Then Tom Willis is led in to stand face to face with his partner. Slowly, haltingly, fear staring out of his eyes, he repeats the story he has told McGraw and Sears. Then, suddenly... All right, kid. You can stop talking. I'll do the talking from now on. I killed that woman. I jumped at her as she passed the door to the room. 
I beat her down, and then I strangled her. With these two hands, I strangled her. Just the same as I'd strangle anybody else who made insulting remarks about soldiers. Go back to the room now, kid. She said the soldiers was no good. So I decided to kill her. I waited out in the hall until she passed, and then I grabbed her. She didn't even have time to yell. Is that your only reason for killing Clara Minor Waterman? Yeah, that's the only reason. She said what she did. I knew then that I'd have to kill her, and I did. I strangled her with my bare hands. And then I took a lace from my leggings and wound it around her throat till she stopped moving. No one can talk about soldiers that way and get away with it. Because a soldier is the finest person in the world. And now it is our pleasure to present District Attorney Thomas Whelan of San Diego. Mr. Whelan. Alan Waterman was one of the strangest paradoxes in the history of my office. The almost unbelievable reason he gave for having brutally murdered Clara Minor led many to believe he was insane. At his trial, it was proved conclusively that although he was suffering from a form of hysteria, brought on, no doubt, by the uncertainty of the times and the world war, yet he was perfectly capable of thinking clearly. It was also proven by the prosecution that he had actually planned the murder in advance. On May 5, 1919, he was sentenced to San Quentin to serve from ten years to life. His younger companion pled guilty to the Clobber robbery. And in the juvenile department of the Superior Court, he was sentenced to Preston Reformatory at Ione to remain until he reached his majority. Thank you, Mr. Whelan. If Rio Grande cracked gasoline is so full of snap, so full of speed, so full of power, says the skeptical motorist, how can it also be so economical? Now, that's a fair question, and here's the answer. By the patented Sinclair cracking process, gasoline is so thoroughly broken up, that is, so thoroughly cracked, that every possible atom of energy is available for instant combustion. No unburned gasoline drips down your cylinder walls. No raw gasoline escapes through your exhaust. More of each gallon is turned into power. That's why Rio Grande cracked gasoline is more economical. And that is also why Rio Grande gasoline powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. Parallel in importance to the Sinclair cracking process for gasoline is the refining process used for Sinclair motor oils. Here it is a case of doing the same job as others, but doing it better. Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline are thoroughly de-waxed and de-jellied. They flow more freely, stand up under harder abuse, and last longer. Therefore, they make your car last longer. Go to your nearest Rio Grande independent dealer tomorrow and try a crankcase full. And be sure to get a copy of the latest Calling All Cars news, thrilling detective stories, radio and movie news, and free gift news for the youngsters. All about the free junior detective and G-Man outfits. How you can get a dozen different free gifts just by using a few gallons of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. San Diego police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 154. Suspecting this case now in San Quentin. That's all. 